when when I come back in the next life, I want to be Michael Nutter. <laughs> Welcome to this episode of How to Really Run a City, our deep dive into the mystery and mastery of big city leadership. I'm Larry Platt of the Philadelphia Citizen, a nonprofit, nonpartisan media organization that seeks to reinvigorate democracy in the American city where it was born. Check us out at thephiladelphiacitizen.org. So How to Really Run a City features two accomplished practitioners in the art of urban change making: former Philadelphia Mayor Michael Nutter, former Atlanta Mayor Kasim Reed. If you've listened to past episodes, you know the drill. If you're frustrated by the bickering and finger pointing of Washington, D.C., this podcast is for you because there are really three political parties in America, Democrats, Republicans, and mayors who have no choice but to pursue practical solutions. We'll be joined by Baltimore Mayor Brandon Scott, and we'll talk about the collapse in his city of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. We'll talk about the real inroads Baltimore is making under Mayor Scott's leadership in gun violence reduction. And we'll talk a little bit about the secret DJ name that he is keeping from his constituents. So with that, here's this episode of How to Really Run a City. So um, we're going to dive right in because I believe uh, Mayor Scott is already on the line. So I don't want to you know how respectful we want to be with actual mayor's times. Actual mayors, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Unlike um, the former, yeah. Yeah. And speaking of former mayors, our compadre, former Atlanta mayor, Kasim Reed, uh, we're going to be flying solo, likely flying solo today because he had a last minute, le- you know, he still has like a job. He's got a J-O-B, uh, is a high powered legal attorney at a firm. So he's got, so so something came up. I mean, what do you think I'm doing? <laughs> You know, I mean, I feel like I'm like Fredo in this conversation. I'm smart. <laughs> I can do things. I can handle things. I'm smart. Not like everybody says. Like dumb. I'm smart and I want respect. I was passed over. I think things are going to end much better for you than they did on for Fredo. But don't go out on any rowboats. <laughs> no boat. No boat. Holy Mary, Mother of God. Pray for us sinners. I'm going fishing. I'm going out. Anybody want to give me a ride? No, no, no. I'm good. I got my own car. (laughs) So I'm hoping uh, there's a small chance he might call in because, you know, we've had numerous times where you've called in from your car. So I'm hoping that the score is settled. You think we're going to get him on the road? That's what I'm hoping. But uh, in the the Kasim car? In the Kasim mobile. He's in L.A. What do you think he drives? What do you think he drives? Oh, what? He's he's a Porsche guy, not uh, Lamborghini, not Maserati, not. I mean, he's, at, he's at level. I mean, I know who he hangs out with. Wait till he hears this. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're gonna get to Baltimore Mayor Brandon Scott, but I just have to touch base with you on because last time we talked, that was pre-convention, pre-Kamala, yeah. really. And yeah. are yeah. you are yeah. you surprised at the turn that these last four weeks have taken? I'm I'm overjoyed not to grab Stevie Wonder's uh, song. I think the thing about us as as Democrats, we just sometimes take a little while to (laughs) to get to where we're supposed to go. But at the end, I think what President Biden did, if there were another um, second edition of Profiles and Courage, he's in the first chapter. Yeah. Virtually no one does what he did. Uh, and then with speed, kind of, I think it was like a half hour later, he announced his support for Vice President Harris. It actually, it reminded me a little bit in a very different way. It reminded me of 2020. So, and you know, I was on the, I was on the Bloomberg campaign in, in 2020. And, um. You were the chairman of that campaign. I was national political director, national yeah. political chair. And so we rolled in, you roll into Super Tuesday and, you know, things didn't go well for us. And so Mike literally dropped out the next day and then South Carolina happened. After failing to fire early in the race, 
Joe Biden has reloaded his campaign. The 77-year-old moderate clinched a resounding victory in the South, propelled by an outpouring of support from African-American voters. Thanks to all of you, the heart of the Democratic Party, we just won and we won big because of you. And almost every day, somebody dropped out and immediately consolidated around Joe Biden. And I think this is a, this is a version of that. We knew this was a unique moment to consolidate in a short period of time. Yeah, yeah. We yeah, figured it out. That's exactly right. Um, it's been a fascinating, fascinating month, man. Um, yeah. And and one of the cool things about the convention was we got to see the rising stars of mm-hmm. the Democratic Party, and they are innumerable. And one of them is with us today, 40-year-old uh, Baltimore Mayor Brandon Scott. Mayor Scott, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Good to see you, Mr. Mayor. Hey, man. How you doing, man? I'm good. I'm good. Look, I'm back home. I got back to Baltimore yeah. around 1030 today, so I, I'm good. Okay. Very and good. Ready to get back to work. Very good. I understand that. But you know, he's also, Larry, you know, uh, very recently married, like two weeks ago, I think. Uh, it I two two weeks, two weeks on Sunday. Yes, sir. Right. Thank you very right. much. Right. Surprise, a quote unquote surprise wedding. Oh, no, it was a surprise. No, the caterer didn't even know that they were catering. Well, it wasn't a surprise to you and your wife. No, no, think. not to us. No, no. <laughs> y'all surprised everybody else. You surprised everybody else. Everybody yeah, that's else. amazing. I, yeah. I did, I did see that. And in this day and age, to keep that from the media is pretty amazing. And and it, I'm going to tell you, uh, gentlemen, it was amazing. We thought that we were going to get most people surprised, but. Uh, earlier that day, we went and took pictures at City Hall and some places around the city that mean a lot to us. And mm-hmm. a couple of folks saw us, but no one, you know, ratted us out on social media. Thank goodness it, it, was, it was some of our uh, older adults that saw us and they don't believe in letting people's business out until they're ready. So uh, we there you really, go. There really you go. grateful that it wasn't a, a bunch of millennials out early in the morning. Today. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's hilarious. Uh, hey, hey, like I said, I don't know if Mayor Reed is going to join us, but I, so I wanted to go back a, a few weeks when, unfortunately, the tragedy happened and the Francis Scott Key Bridge uh, came down and... Um, we did talk about it, and I want to play a clip of the mayor's talking about it for you, uh, Mayor Scott, before we before we go any further. JP, you got that lined up? Uh, before we get uh, our guest, Dallas-Fort Worth Mayor Maddie Parker, there's something important this week that I wanted to bring up with you guys. We are taping this days after the Baltimore Bridge collapse, and I think we should give a shout out to Baltimore Mayor uh, Brandon Scott, who who handled and this. And Governor Moore. And Governor Moore. But I saw Mayor Scott go on, actually, he, went, he like went on Fox News and other news outlets, and he handled this crazy racist reaction to, to the tragedy with moral righteousness. This was a tragic accident, but it seems these days when something like this happens in this country, there are always conspiracy theories and a lot of misinformation thrown around. And in the case of this accident, some downright nasty things said. He's been called a DEI mayor yeah. and blamed for this thing in some unconscionable way. We know, listen, I am a young black man, a young black mayor in this country. We know that there are a lot of racists and folks who don't think I should be in this job. I know that. I've been black my whole life. I know how racist and racism goes in this country. But my focus is always going to be on those people. I didn't want to be out there that night asking, answering questions about the AI. I'm worried about the loss of life. We know how ridiculous that is. Those folks are afraid, as I said this week, to use the N word. This should not be even in conversation. Yeah, DEI is just a new word for nigga. Yeah. That was Mayor Reed uh, joining us from the Wayback Machine, not not so far way back. But I wanted to begin with that because uh, Mayor Scott, you 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 went on TV and redefined. I love this. You redefined the acronym DEI. Do you remember how you how you did that? Oh yes, <laughs> duly elected incumbent. Joining me now is Baltimore Mayor Brandon Scott. Uh, I will allow you, uh, Mayor Scott, if you choose to do so, to respond to the tomfoolery uh, and attacks on you for having the nerve to be black and also a mayor. 
I know, and we all know, and you know very well, that black men and young black men in particular have been the boogeyman for those who are racist and think that only uh, uh, straight, wealthy white men should have a saying anything. And what they mean by DAI, in my opinion, is duly elected incumbent. Uh, we know what they want to say, uh, but they don't have the courage to say the N-word. Mm. Yeah. Uh, when Joanne Reed asked me that question, I had no idea what I was going to that I was going to say that that's full style off the top of the dome. And we of course then turned it into hoodies and t-shirts that we sold for the campaign. Actually last <laughs> night, as I saw uh, my duly elected incumbent vice president, accept the nomination for, for the presidency I had on a DEI shirt with her face on it uh, that, nice. I, that I proudly wear to remind yeah. folks who say she's the DEI uh, vice president that she did earn it. And she's duly elected and doing a damn good job. Absolutely. Good stuff. We should note here that Mayor Scott is uh, handily won the Democratic primary. He will, uh, starting in January, be be starting his second term. December, um, December the 3rd. To December. Day. Oh, OK. There you go. Uh, and so congratulations Thank to you. you. And uh, one of the things that you said on election night was you, you, you told the crowd tonight, you made it very clear that your democracy was not for sale. I say good evening, Baltimore. Yeah. It's safe to say that we're destined for a second term. And Baltimore tonight, you said very clearly that your democracy is not for sale. No matter how rich they are. You have confirmed once again that the naysayers who underestimate our city will never, ever understand what truly makes Baltimore great. And you have run a clean government, which in Baltimore is not not always the case. Uh, and both of you come from sort of that standpoint in your respective mayoralties. Uh, how do you turn a culture in the way that both of you uh, have and done? I think that for me, as a Baltimorean and as a, a young black man growing up here, and I spoke about this, uh, Mr. Mayor, I uh, had to address what, what we call my second home state's uh, breakfast uh, at the convention this week in North Carolina. Uh, and the mayor knows that uh, uh, my dad's family is from rural North Carolina. And when I'm addressing them, I'm talking about uh, why. I lead the way I lead. And it's not just because I love my city. I want to do things the right thing. Although that is true. But it's also I'm very cognizant of what has happened for me through the hard work of my family. My grandparents that toiled on a pig farm in rural North Carolina. The things that they experienced. The things that I saw them experience when I was growing up and spending so much time there as a, as a young man. The same thing for my mom's parents who left rural Virginia and came here. There is, I'm never going to do anything uh, to disgrace their name and the work that they put in for me to be in this position. But also I have a higher responsibility to do this job in the most ethical way so that uh, future young people that look like me, they wear their head like me or however they want to wear it will be entrusted with this position. And I think that it comes with that higher responsibility for, to do it that way. Does that sound familiar to you? Can you relate to that, Mayor Nutter? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we are we are raised in a certain way about you know our our name and our standing uh, in in the community. Often uh, there's just a higher level expectation. Often you don't really have to worry about what your enemies are up to. You usually keep them in check. A lot of times you got to keep track of your friends <laughs> and what they're doing. Often in your name. Right? Oh, I talked to the mayor. He said. She said. Whatever. Whatever. Nah. That doesn't really sound like me. I didn't say that. No, I don't think, I think so. That, I think, Mr. Mayor, people don't know that. That's like uh, 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 probably about 1% of being a mayor is telling people, I didn't say that. Like, people will say anything. Oh, well, they said, someone said, the mayor said, I'm like, well, did you ask me? Because I absolutely didn't say that. I don't even know who that is. Right, right, right. Well, Mayor Daughter, when you were mayor, I remember a uh, fairly prominent real estate developer who was who had contributed to your campaign complaining to me about the fact that he couldn't get to you that 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 you were that you kept having him deal with whoever 
deals with developers. And he was used to going straight to the mayor. And I might have actually, mea culpa, right? I might have reported that as a legitimate complaint. It wasn't until later that I realized, actually, you were doing what good government demands, right? You were you, you were saying, no, deal with the proper person in the channel. First of all, what would I know, really, about building a building? Seriously. I sent them, the developers, I sent them to the people who could actually help them do their project. I, what I told them was invite me to the groundbreaking, invite me to the river cutting. It, it, otherwise, go see the development team. Sometimes people don't understand, even when you're the name, you're not directly engaged in everything that's happening in the city. I mean, it'd be like somebody asking me, like, well, they didn't pick up my trash. <laughs> okay, I can help you get your trash picked up, but I can't pick it up for you. People don't understand that. They they think that like you're involved and also in charge of everything. I think that's a yeah. key thing. I was having this discussion with 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 someone uh during during this week and and they said, "What's the what one of the frustration mm -hmm. like, look, hold me accountable for the things that I'm accountable to, right? But like if if our public transit system is MTA and the first M means Maryland, I don't ask me. <laughs> right like i got enough of my own stuff to deal with we and we have to do a lot of education but people have to understand that like the mayor i always tell uh, our young people when i'm talking in schools and things like that is that the mayor is the ceo i'm the ceo of a four billion dollar entity known as the city of baltimore right you won't you you don't think that bill gates was involved in every single thing at microsoft it's it's fascinating, um, Mayor Scott. On the you know we touched on the the bridge thing, but let's talk. There are a lot of practitioners who listen to this podcast, and walk us through. You know, we talked about the ridiculous criticism which you handled brilliantly, but also just walk us through what it's like. You both have had this, uh, uh, Mayor Nutter. You had the Amtrak uh, derailment. You get a call in the middle of the night and say, "What, what happens?" They say. A bridge just disappeared. I'll never, I'll never forget it. I, at that point, I had a three-month-old at home. Uh, so that day, actually, Mr. Mayor, uh, uh, the day before uh, the twenty-fifth was my state of the city address. Mm. So I gave my state of the city address, hung out with my constituents at the location for a while, and then my family we came home. Uh, uh, the little one decided to go to sleep around like one fifteen ish. Uh, 136 to be exact, uh, I think is the exact time that my fire chief called and he said, sir, um, the key bridge is gone. And I said, repeat that. And he said, it's gone. It's in the water, sir. A container ship hit it. Overnight in Baltimore, Maryland, a portion of the Francis Scott Key Bridge has collapsed. You see what happened down into the harbor. That large boat collided with the bridge around 1.30 this morning. Authorities are trying to rescue at least seven people who were doing overnight work on the bridge. They're believed to have been tossed into the waves. I think this is the, the uh, amazing thing about mayors because we go through so many of these emergency situations, we just click into muscle memory like uh, OEM, emergency management muscle memory. So I said, where are you? He says, I'm at Fort Armstead Park. I'm on my way, right? So I got both phones. I tell my unit to come pick me up, and then I start making calls. I call the governor, right? You know, I, he tells the story out publicly now. I didn't get him because he was asleep. I got his chief of staff right after, and then I'm calling the Senate president and the council president and all these other folks, and then I'm in my car. I'm in my car calling these folks as I'm hitting lights and sirens down to to where the key bridge is. And only, and this is such, and, and Mr. Mayor, you appreciate this, which people don't understand how important that cooperation and that collaboration was that first from that first moment. Mm -hmm. Because if you're driving on Interstate 695, right, and you're going across the key bridge, at the beginning, when you're leading up to it, you're in Arundel County. Then you're in Baltimore City for literally like this much. And then you're in Baltimore County. So you had three different jurisdictions. But the call came in to uh, my fire department, which put us in the immediate aftermath in the beginning. And then we're just doing what we do. And I think that uh, I, did, I blinked and it was six o'clock 
and and we were we were having the the you know that late later press conference in the day. But for me, because I've been through this, so this is now my seventeenth year in city government, right? I've been in the OEM room since I was an intern. I have this uh, historical knowledge, but also the experience of dealing with these. We had uh, when I first got elected, we had two blocks of houses explode, right? Like. Right. I had that. Right. We had three firefighters die tragically inside of a building. I had a guy dangling outside of another building. We had underground fires. Right. Obviously, we deal with the storms. We had a little pop up tornado and we mayors are so used to that. We're able to stay cool, stay calm and just remember remember the training, essentially, everything that we need to do and having these things and agencies work in the way that, that we do. And I think uh, the way. Uh, we all work together. And I remember the first conversations with some of the folks from state and other. I was like, the most important thing is that everyone understands that we have to work together when it's time for this agency to be the lead. They'll be the lead. No one's going to be like this. There's, there's no no need for anyone to just not tell everybody everything. And we were able to do it in a way which I think the best reflection of that is that we had the House Appropriations Committee come up and look at the site on a U.S. Coast Guard boat with the Coast Guard, myself, the governor, everybody. And we heard time and time and time from them, right, from Republicans, Democrats, people from all over the country, that they have uh, been and dealt with many of these national emergencies like this one was. But this is the best example of cooperation, federal, state, and local that they've ever seen. And I couldn't agree more from the president on down to myself and the county executives and the folks that work for the governor, that work for me, everyone has been lockstep. And that's how we were able to achieve this reopening as quickly as we did. You also have to be emotionally intelligent on the spot. And I remember, um, and you both can speak to this because I can think of numerous times, Mayor Nutter, where you've exhibited this, but I I saw you, I think on that very night, someone asked you, Mayor Scott, um, what about rebuilding the bridge? And you said, you you on the spot instinctively said, we're going to talk about that. But right now, there are human lives uh, that have been lost. And, and I thought, I don't think I would have had the presence of mind. I would have answered the question. <laughs> you know, wait, tell me what went through your mind there. I think that when you're in a situation like this, who you are comes out. Because you can't hide it, right? You're in a pressure situation. When you're in an emergency like that, the true you is going to shine through. And for me, I'm thinking about those people when I'm standing up there, right? I was expecting to get some kind of ridiculous question from the media. Now, I thought it would be national media. That actually was a local radio host who you would think, someone that takes the bridge all the time, you would think he would have better sense to ask me such a stupid and ridiculous question at that time. But... I walked up from there talking when we're walking down. If you look at the video, when we're walking down, I'm talking to the fire chief and he's telling me what the divers are seeing in the water and that they can't see but a foot in front of them and there's strap metal where we might have to pull people out. So I'm only thinking about the the lives that are that at that point we didn't know if they were alive or not, but also the lives of my divers, the county's divers, the state divers, all of these folks. And we a big bridge can be rebuilt. But those six lives can never be replaced. And I just thought that it was important in that moment for me to set the tone for the entirety of us dealing with this tragedy that first and foremost, that this has to be about human lives. So uh, I was very proud of myself for not cursing uh, uh, that day because I, I I didn't say what I thought in my mind immediately, but really wanted to, to set that standard because that's what it should be about. The bridge can be rebuilt, right? Traffic and all of that, we got the port back open, that will happen. But in that moment, not only is it ridiculous because we should be thinking about these people that we didn't know whether they were alive or dead at that exact moment, but more importantly, Who's going to know how long the bridge is going to take to be rebuilt? And like we haven't even looked at it yet. Right. And I think that that's a conversation that we have to have about this sensationalism and this immediacy that that we as a people in our country are, are getting and expecting from media when sometimes you just need to wait and be patient. That conversation will come at the appropriate time. But while people are trying to save someone's life, uh, that shouldn't be asked. What you said about setting the tone right in that moment, that is so critical because everything else that follows has to, has to be framed 
in the tone that was set at the beginning. Um, I know you said you, you kept your presence of mind. Larry knows they actually wrote a story about uh, all the various times that I cursed, um, that, that folks asking me ridiculous questions. And then I would often get an email, uh, from my mother, um, <laughs> who would say, um, Michael, I, I, I saw you on the TV. Um, I know that you have an expanded vocabulary and you know how to express yourself and you really shouldn't talk like that in television. And I would say, well, mom, you know, you're right. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, the, the person really was like a jerk, but I'll do better next time. And that's right. And so there were other times, there were other times yeah. where I was standing at a lecture and I was about to say something and I start, I, I can't deal with the email tomorrow. Let me, let me check myself. I just, I can't take another email from my mom. I get that. Hey, hey, Mayor Scott, I also think congratulations are in order for your gun violence uh, strategies. If memory serves down 21, homicide down 21% last year and 36% so far this year. A little, little, little bit of a flip. So homicides were down uh, 20% last year. And as we're, which is uh, just to point this out, is the largest single year reduction that the city of Baltimore has ever had. And nobody's ever had a reduction that big. And this year, we're beating that with a 28%. 28. That's amazing. That's great. We had an earlier uh, guest on the on the podcast, David Muhammad. Uh, oh, yes. And you're really doing some of what he's talked about, that focused deterrence, yep. carrot and stick approach. Is that is that right? And is that and and Mayor Nutter, you did it in South Philly as a pilot program. Mm -hmm. And I, I just have to get this off my chest, man. That pilot program, homicides were down 35 percent in that district and your predecessor killed the program. Successor. Yeah. Uh, or successor. I'm sorry. Yeah. David is a, as a friend and a great partner. He actually is one of our technical advisors for our focus of Torrance model, what we call our group violence reduction strategy. This isn't the first time that this has been tried in Baltimore. It's actually the third, but the only time that we've gotten it to now expand uh, throughout the city. We have uh, a few districts districts remaining, but we've gotten it in many of the districts across the city. And really uh, what it is, is it's a public health informed approach, right? Uh, the mayor and I, we know this very well, but we know now, right? My grandmother would always say, uh, when you know better, you do better. Uh, we, I don't, I don't cast out any, any blame. I don't have any animosity in my heart to folks who were the mayor in the nineties and two thousands when they were doing zero tolerance. And for me, ended up being policing while black, right? I don't, I don't hold any animosity towards them for trying to make the city safer. The 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 frustration that I have is now that we're doing things in a different way and getting, you know, faster reduction results. Right. Folks still want to act like uh, these things didn't happen. And like me, I was putting handcuffs like seven times. It was just a blessing that they never actually took me to central bookings. Even as a college student coming home with a trunk and car full of everything from my college. Right. But the folks that I knew in my neighborhood, they carried a gun every day. They decided who died, lived or died in my neighborhood every day. They never seemed to get arrested, right? I knew who they are. So how the hell did the city, the police department not know who they are? But now we flip that on its head. Instead of saying that everybody that lives in a neighborhood like mine is the most likely to be the victim or perpetrator of gun violence, we actually did the data and see who they were. We started in the Western District, which at that point was a 3.7 square mile area with 30,000 people in it. But it, it accounted for 16 percent of the violence in the city of Baltimore in an area that small. Right. And what we did is we go out to these folks and we tell them they get actually get a letter from me. I know who you are. I know what you do. I want you to stay alive. I want you to be able to provide for your family. Uh, but. You can't do that doing what you're doing. What do you need? Do you need housing? Do you need job training? Do you need mental health? Do you need to be relocated? Whatever you need will help you. But if you don't, if you tell me pound sand, the next group of people that you're going to hear from are going to be our law enforcement partners. And there will be no coming back from that. 
and what uh, we did, we launched this in the Western District in 2022. Uh, and as of 819, uh, we had 165 folks receive services, 295 arrests, 92 percent. of the people have not uh, recidivated and 93% of the folks have not been re-victimized. That shows that we're working. And across our GVRS districts, approximately 60 to 75% of homicides are tied to group violence, these small groups of people. And that's why we're, we're doing it in this way. We're currently active in the Western, and we went to the Southwest and the Central. Now we're in the Eastern District, right? Uh, we're we're going to be moving to the Southern District later this year. And we're seeing the benefits of that focus, right? Because I've seen it. I was actually... at my uh, oldest son's basketball game earlier this spring. And a young man in the hallway comes up to me and says, Mr. Man, I got to show you something. I said, what's up? He's a teenager there to see his little brother play. And he says, go, he says, I'll be back. He goes and gets his phone. He shows me a copy of his letter. And I said, well, are you ready for us to help? And he says, oh, no, I'm already good. I signed up the day after I got the letter. So that's the kind of impact uh, that, we're, that we're seeing across the city. And it's also allowing our police department to focus and being able to get more guns off the street, right? And that kind of approach that we have balancing it out so that everything's not on them. Everything shouldn't be on the police department. And we're not even happy with that. We want to have even greater success every day. Mayor, you mentioned the Southern District. I want to commend you again. So I, I'm a senior advisor to the relatively new policing leadership academy out at the University of Chicago. And I have a cohort of officers who since graduated. But I had Major Jason Bennett from the Southern District uh, within my cohort. Yeah, Major, Major and I have been friends for a long time. We started out in city government together. He was just an officer. I was just a, a staffer, actually, when I met you, Mr. Mayor. And he just, it's been great to see him rise up through the ranks. And I think that, and you know this, but for, for you, Lawrence, he actually... Uh, was essentially we picked Jason to go to the Southern District because it's the home of where we had the Brooklyn mass shooting last year. So he's went into an extremely tough situation and has done a great job. Right. I was down down there recently and just saw how the community is responding to him uh, versus what was there before. And it's, it's the, what we want to see uh, in, in our police leadership. That's awesome. I love the 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 touch of the letter from the mayor. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's really super innovative. And 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 Mayor Nutter, uh, you know, I know I joke around by saying you don't have you don't have a job. You have many jobs, including this program <laughs> in Chicago. Uh, so so to, to set the record straight, I'm, I don't see you as Fredo. I'm your older brother, Mike, and I was stepped over. That's the way Pop wanted it. It ain't the way I wanted it. Lawrence, I just say that actually you'll get to see the building of my group violence reduction strategy in a documentary called The Body Politic that PBS will air on November the 25th. Wow. Violence is what's dominated our city for the 37 years that I've been alive. I grew up in the 1980s and 90s. If you were black and you were outside, you could be taken to jail for any simple thing. We've been doing this all my life, but violence is still here. We have to police better. We have to change things for ourselves because no one's gonna do it for us. The youngest mayor in the city's history trying to restore trust in government. You cannot go anywhere in Baltimore without seeing the aftermath of gun violence. We've seen other strategies that are rooted in penalty. We are going to be reimagining public safety in Baltimore. We take guys who used to be shooters and killers, and they're now interceding in the violence. We the peacemakers. Many of us have been to prison, but now we work to defuse violence in our community. Governor today insisted the city's cure will not work. Trying to reduce crime by defunding police is dangerous, radical, far left lunacy. You can't plead on trying to clean up the streets. What do you want to say about this past weekend? Can you handle this crime situation right now? The blood of 300 to be on your hands, Mr. Mayor. If the forces come to get me in four years, so be it. But I know when I'm done, I'll be able to say that I never compromised myself or my city. All right, all right, good stuff.
This is about building systems so that young boys and girls don't have to live through what I lived through. We want murder to understand it cannot have the last say. Just because you showed up, love is showing up behind. 50 years from now, or however long it takes, people will know we must have been doing a lot of good work in order for it to get that way. That's awesome. I, I was reading about the the filmmaker who spent like a couple years uh, while while battling his own health issues. Yeah, uh, sounded like a fascinating guy, and a and a, I can't wait to see to see the film. Thanks for uh, alerting us to that. Yeah, you're gonna help change the narrative about your city. Yeah, what is that? That was one of the questions, which is going into your second term. What is the biggest challenge to changing that narrative, given the work you've the accomplishments of the first term? Well, we have to deepen the work. And I think the, the mayor just hinted, you you change that narrative by continuing to sustain the results, right? If you guys were interviewing me six, seven, eight years ago and said that the White House will be lifting up Baltimore as an example of how to deal with gun violence, I probably would laugh at you, right? But like, that's what's happening now. The cities are right at the right for a really, really, really big comeback. And now we're just trying to make sure that Everyone benefits from that, especially Baltimoreans that have lived here and, and told through all of the bad things for all of these many years. And that's what we're really trying to do is sustain the success that we're having. And that will be the narrative when you sustain it. And it's not just one year, two years when you sustain it over a period of time, which can only be done by sustaining the level of work and investment into this all and above approach, which is why elections matter so much, as Mr. Mayor pointed out, like his pilot the way right we have to think about even how this connects to the national election right cities have the best direct support for dealing with gun violence that they've ever had under this vice president and this and this president and we have to continue that if we want to see this happen not just for baltimore but cities around the country well but what you both have have shown is that this is doable under mayor nutter a 60-year low in homicides uh, the work that you're doing, these uh, epidemics of violence are often the result of either particular policy choices or bad implementation, right? It's usually one, one or the other. And you both have shown that you can make serious inroads in, in this, in this uh, seemingly intractable problem. You can literally change the trajectory. I'm sure, the mayor will agree in most, in most instances. We won't ever necessarily meet those folks, and they may not ever meet one of us. But you can change people's lives in this job. Well, finally, Mayor, Mayor Scott, has anyone figured out your DJ name yet? No, and I'm not worried about them figuring it out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mayor, Mayor, Mayor Nutter, he's, he's offered, I believe you've offered $200 to all, that. All of my college uh, classmates. So this is this is this is the the key to that, right? I've never had a drink of alcohol in my life. So when uh, you're DJing parties, of course, like people are are normally drinking. I'm the one with all the evidence. So, <laughs> uh, you know, we're not. We're, I'm not. You don't see any worry or, or in my eye at all. <laughs> are are the cities youth though trying to dig it up? <laughs> so one group did try. One group of students did try because their teacher actually went to, to school with me and we were on a Zoom actually. And they're asking them all of these different things. And then I just text him a picture of himself in college. And then he says, look, I can't tell you all that. It was that quick. Man. He just let it go. I said, do you want me to put this on the screen in the Zoom, in the Zoom meeting? And that was it. That's awesome. I love it. I love <laughs> That's heavy. That's heavy. Well, and, you know, with it's stories like that. We, we saw this for in, the, in the DNC, this idea of bringing joy back to politics. Uh, you're doing yeah. it there in in Baltimore. And certainly, Mayor Nutter, you did it when you when when you were in, and you continue to do it with your with your F-bombs here on the podcast. Uh, so, I've been good the whole time. Good. No, today you have been. Yes. But that's because you were talking about your mom. <laughs> exactly. I can't thank you enough, uh, Mayor Scott, for the time today and also your your service and congratulate you for all, all you've done. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank Keep you. It up, man. Absolutely. Stay in touch. Call me when you need me. You know, I will. Thank you. That was fun. Uh, and what a, what an impressive young man. Yeah. We, we weren't joined by Hollywood, Hollywood Reed.
you know, we don't we don't get to rip him so very much. So, you know, I can't wait till next time we're on. But the, the thing with Satine is, even if you give him a shot, I mean, he's just always going to come back with something that's so just so fucking erudite and in depth and 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 heavy that you know you just don't really want to mess with him. You know? No, I know, I know. I'm 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 brave when he's not on the podcast. <laughs> uh, as always, man, this was great. All right, man. Well, that's it for this episode of How to Really Run a City. If you like what you're listening to, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and tell your friends about us. We really want to widen the conversation because by 2050, something like two thirds of the world will live in cities. As cities go, so goes the nation and so goes the world. For now, thanks for listening and we'll see you next time. Hey, all remember to check out the Good Government Show podcast, where host Dave Martin conducts conversations with elected leaders about how government can work for all of us. Check out the Good Government Show wherever you get your podcasts or visit goodgovernmentshow.com.